Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome everyone to the United Nations Science, Technology, and Innovation Forum side event, Youth Innovation, Ensuring Good Food for All for Today and Tomorrow. This event is hosted by the World Food Forum and the Food and Agriculture Organizations of the United Nations, with support from a number of partners who are here with us today, uh, including our co-organizers, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, or UNIDO, and Extreme Tech Challenge. My name is Ed Bogart, the Deputy Director of the World Food Forum, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, Celeste McElwain, and an esteemed panel at the United Nations headquarters in New York. For those who are following online, welcome. Thank you for joining. So the World Food Forum was launched just over four years ago. It was an idea and a grassroots initiative started by the Youth Committee of FAO with the mission of empowering young people from around the world to create a better food future for all, leaving no one behind. As you will see today, the reach and impact of our activities have grown significantly since then, and it showcases the power that young people can have when they are given the opportunity to have a meaningful seat at the table and the support to bring the ideas to life. Now I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Celeste McElwain, the head of our World Food Forum Innovation Lab. Over to you, Celeste. Thank you, Ed. To kick, things, to kick things off today, I would like to start by introducing a distinguished guest who will deliver the opening remarks. I would like to welcome Carol Bellamy, former chair of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, who will share some of her thoughts on, on the critical role that youth, youth must play in leading innovation to achieve the SDGs. Carol has led a wide-ranging and distinguished career and has supported the empowerment of youth, um, uh, the empowerment of youth in many contexts, including in her prior role as, an, as executive director of UNICEF. Carol, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, let me welcome you to the UN. I'm sitting here thinking I started here almost 30 years ago, so it's nice to see some young faces in this. Uh, place, too many old people. <laughs> so uh, let me uh, thank uh, FAO and the World Food Forum, not only for inviting me to speak, but also for this event. Because it's hard to see how the many challenges that uh, we face today, and particularly that young people face today, can be solved unless young innovators actually lead the way. I know it's uh, probably all too easy to feel pessimistic when we look at the scale of the challenges, so I'm just going to start obviously with two pessimistic thoughts, but then hopefully move from there. First, as things presently stand, more people will go to bed hungry in 2030 than they will tonight. Second, there will be as many people hungry in 2030 as there were in 2015 when we adopted the SDGs, committing at that point to promise to end hunger by 2030. But one look at the agenda for this forum, in fact, one look around this room, makes me feel optimistic, as I just said a moment ago. What a wealth of talent, energy, and creativity we have here today. In my view, this is a room full of solutions. Ending world hunger, as the title of the forum says, ensuring good food for all, for today and tomorrow, demands that we find better, faster, and smarter ways to do what works and to take them to scale. And young people, in my view, have a vital role to play here. Last year, I was honored to be able to work with the Rockefeller Foundation and a group of global experts on food to come up with a roadmap for greater food security. And I see, and I'm going to speak about two areas in particular, where I think we need you, young people, your skills, ideas, and commitment. First is anticipation. To put it simply, the world needs to get ahead of the curve in hunger. We can already predict drought, heat waves, and even floods. We've seen that, one, that a conflict just in one place, Ukraine, can derail food supplies more than 3,000 miles away in the Horn of Africa. More than half of all humanitarian crises are thought to be predictable. So it must be possible to help families and communities prepare for them by building their long-term resilience long before the crisis hits. In my view, there has to be more investment, for example, in sustainable and climate-smart agriculture. 
from regenerative farming that sustains natural ecosystem processes to mobile, mobile apps that connect farmers to current innovations to the latest market information and most importantly to each other. We know that handheld digital devices and remote sensing can track carbon in the soil while drones can help farmers spot land that needs irrigation or other help. But again, we also know that there's a digital divide. Those in the greatest need of such modern technologies are often the least likely to have them. So a challenge for you. I hope and expect that you, people in this room, have some great solutions to help close that gap. My second point is localization. Localization that puts communities in the driving seat. It seems only logical to make sure that funding, skills, and solutions can all be found as close as possible to those who face the food crisis. We always need to be thinking context, recognizing that one size solutions do not fit all. And here, again, there is a role for young researchers who work with local communities to map what is happening, who it's happening to, and who is already doing something about it. Again, I know that we have such researchers in this room, and I'm thrilled about that. So what I'm talking about, and I hope you will be talking about it as well, is about unlocking new opportunities and having the courage to do what works. That means doing things differently, because let's face it, Business as usual isn't particularly working. I hope you will excuse the cliche, but the definition of insanity is doing things the same way over and over again and expecting a different result. And perhaps having those same people doing the same way is part of the problem. You're not the same people. So we need to unleash a younger generation to challenge the status quo. That's what you have to do, challenge the status quo in the best possible sense. So I commend the world of, of Food Forum for nurturing the extraordinary potential of young innovators, scientists, researchers, and more, and inspiring youth-led solutions that are having a tangible impact on communities. I'm enthused by the Innovation Lab, which elevates youth-led solutions that are making a difference and its transformative research challenge for young researchers. A home for precisely the out-of-the-box research and thinking ideas that we need. From the Startup Innovation Award to the Youth Food Lab and the Young Scientist Group, what a phenomenal global resource. I hope that some of my colleagues here at the UN take advantage of it. Before I came here today, I asked myself, what is the best way for government UN agencies, and even old people like me to support young innovators, scientists, and researchers like yourself. And I think it is by walking beside you rather than pushing you in a particular direction, by listening to you rather than telling you, by connecting you to each other, which is why I think this forum is so welcome, and by connecting you to policymakers and amplifying your voice to make sure that they are your voices to make sure that they are heard. But above all, by clearing a path for you and then getting out of your way. So having said that, I will now get out of your way. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to listening to you and learning from you all today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carol, for those inspiring words. And I, I think we would all agree business as usual is not going to work. So I think we're, we're here today here to hear a little bit more about what is new and what is not the same business. So to go over some of the agenda for today, I'll pass it over to Celeste. Over to you. Thank you, Ed. So today we are delighted to present some of the key initiatives of the World Food Forum's Innovation Lab at this year's UN Science, Technology and Innovation Forum. At the World Food Forum and Innovation Lab, we have created an ecosystem for young innovators to become part of all of our activities at any stage of their innovation journey. We look to support a range of projects all the way from idea stage initiatives through to established startups. 
This event will be divided into three main parts that cover our core programs. Firstly, we will hear from one of last year's winners of the Transformative Research Challenge, a global competition that looks to recognize out-of-the-box research led by uh, young academics. Next, we will hear from a recent participant in the World Food Forum's Youth Food Lab, our incubator program for young entrepreneurs all around the world. And finally, we are going to launch this year's edition of the World Food Forum's Startup Innovation Awards, powered by Extreme Tech Challenge. And to top off the Innovation Lab activities, we are thrilled to announce a new and exciting project, a World Food Forum Unido Joint Startup Accelerator Program. In the second part of the event, we will hear from two members of the World Food Forum's Young Scientists Group, a fantastic ensemble of young scientists and researchers who will introduce some of the exciting work they are, they are preparing for, for later this year. Last, but certainly not least, we are honored to have Katja Lesser, ECOSOC Ambassador for the Kingdom of the Netherlands and FAO's very own Director of the Office of Innovation, Vincent Martin, who will reflect on the fascinating youth-led initiatives pre presented throughout today's session. So there's a lot of exciting things ahead of us. We've got a lot to get through. So I'm now going to hand over to Nancy Nesual, one of last year's winners of the Transformative Research Challenge. As I mentioned, this is a global competition which engages and inspires young researchers to innovate in their field of expertise and to explore solutions to sustainably transform our agri-food systems, contribute to climate action, and to end hunger. For the fourth edition, we are partnering with UN agencies, nonprofits, universities, and research institutions to create five prizes focused on pressing agri-food system challenges. In partnership with Wageningen University and Research and with the FAO's One Health and Disease Control Group, we are offering a global One Health Prize. There is a plant-based food prize co-hosted with Meatless Monday and Simon Fraser University, a prize on food loss and waste in partnership with FAO's Nutrition and Food Systems Divisions, EIT Food are sponsoring a prize on water and its crucial role in transforming agri-food systems, FAO's Secretariat for the Eradication of Peste um, Petit Ruminant are also co-hosting a prize on gender mainstreaming in this very important topic. And finally, we have, a plant, uh, we have a plant breeding and nutrition prize in partnership with the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics. The 2024 edition of the TRC was launched in March earlier this year. There are $200,000 worth of prizes, including travel for finalists for the World Food Forum flagship event in October, research grants and internship and consultancy opportunities at some of these prestigious institutions. We are still accepting applications until the 15th of May, so I strongly urge all young researchers out there to visit the Transformative Research Challenge page on our website where you can find out more and apply to all of these prizes. So without further ado, I will hand over to Nancy to tell us more about her Transformative Research Challenge experience. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So my name is Nancy. I'm from DRC Congo but based in Montreal right now. So I represent the winning team, one of the winning team for TOC Challenge 2023. Today, I would like to, pre -present, our, to present to you our project on that stopping, stopping leptocirrhosis, an integrated approach for public health and environmental sustainability. So our project wants to combat leptocirrhosis in Kisanto region in DRC. No, sorry. Yeah, okay, thank you. We are a multidisciplinary team, so we want to eradicate leptocirrhosis in the central region. This negative disease combat human health, agriculture, and biodiversity in, our, in a lot of communities in the world. So our team includes a doctor, an historian, a veterinarian, a computer scientist, and an agronomist. Enable us to approach this complex problem from different angles. Our commitment to this cause has been strengthened by our experiences as winners of TRC Challenge 2023. So this, zono, this zoonotic disease, leptocirrhosis, spread through water and soil, affecting both humans, animals, 
agriculture and the environment. So why we choose Kisantu? We chose Kisantu because it is a representative of many regions of the world facing similar problems. Our methodology includes qualitative and quantitative methods to understand cultural practice, perception, and interaction between human, animals, and the environment. So we have a holistic vision for change, a one alpha approach, a community mobilization, a blending knowledge, and an integrated solution. So what we're doing now, we are currently refining our project protocol for effective implementation. In addition, we are preparing an article on the perception of leptocirrhosis in key central region to better understand the, challenge and the challenges and opportunities. In parallel, we are working to bring together interested partners to support us in this crucial initiative. With the skill accrued through the TLC challenge to guide us through this process. So, <clears throat> by eliminating leptocirrhosis, we will improve public health, revitalize. No, um, no, please, not the slide. Yeah, this is the impact and benefits of our project. By eliminating leptocirrhosis, we will improve public health, revitalize local agriculture and contribute to biodiversity conservation. Our approach will also strengthen community cohesion and serve as a global model for zoonotic disease management. Please. So in imagining a leptocirrhosis free Kisantu, who aspire for a future where children grow up healthily, farmers thrive and biodiversity flourishes. So we want you to join us in this fight for a better Kisan to inspire a global change. Your partnership, your partnership is essential to make this vision a reality. Please. So the time is now to bring health and perspective back in Kisan too. So we cannot do, that, do this alone. We need committed partners to provide our expertise, resources, and vision to help cultivate a future free of leptocirrhosis. Together, we will plant the, the seed today for a traffic key center tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nancy, for sharing a little bit more about your inspiring research. Uh, we're now going to move on to the second um, World Food Forum Innovation Lab uh, program, which is the Youth Food Lab Incubator Program. So it was launched in 2023 in partnership with Wageningen University in Research and the International Association of Students in Agriculture and Related Sciences, and with some of the generous support of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So the Youth Food Lab empowers young innovators from diverse backgrounds to develop and scale their high potential solutions into sustainable business models to transform agri-food systems. We are very excited to announce the creation of a global network of youth food labs rooted in their local context and communities and designed to give young people the tools and resources they need to grow their initiatives and so become drivers of positive change. We've recently launched an online youth food lab program in Latin America, and the first physical presence for a youth food lab is going to be opening at Wageningen University in Research later this year in September. So there is much more to come, so watch this space. But to give you a little bit more of a concrete picture of the youth food lab and how it impacts young innovators and their projects, let's hear from someone who has recently been through the program. I'm pleased to introduce Bibek Shrestha from Wetlands for Nepal, who will tell us more about his experience as a participant of last year's youth food lab. Over to you, Bibek. Thank you, Celeste. Hello, everyone. I'm Bibek Shrestha. I'm from Nepal, and I'm representing my team, Wetlands for Nepal. We are working on a a lot of initiatives mostly targeted around wetland restoration, conservation, and agri-food system transformation. Can we? Um, so uh, let's begin with a story. Um, it's a real story. Too. So in 2021, a group of youths uh, 
from a local youth club called Nagda United Club in Kathmandu reached out to our team, um, which is Sustainability and Environmental Studies Endeavor, our nonprofit. So they were uh, trying to solve the prob problem of encroachment of wetland by invisible species of plant in Kathmandu. And the wetland you see is one of the last remaining natural wetlands in Kathmandu Valley, which is a home to around 3 million people. And uh, as a result of nutrient enrichment from the surrounding catchment and sediment runoff, which largely emanates from uh, unsustainable farming practices, including uh, use of chemical fertilizers, this lake was suffering from water quality degradation and uh, overgrowth of invisible species of plant, which is mostly water hyacinth. So the group were already harvesting the invasive species of plant, but then they didn't know what to do with the harvested invasive species. So they were dumping the harvested plants near the shore of the wetland. That was not helping solve the problem because the plant, as hardy as they are, easily regenerate from the uh, harvested remains. So th the team reached out to our team, and then we sort of worked together to think of innovative ways to tackle the problem. And with support from World Food Fo Forum Youth uh, Food Lab, incubation program last year, we were able to come up with an innovative solution, which is utilizing the harvested um, invasive plants from the wetlands to produce biofertilizers or biopesticides called jhol mol in Nepali, which means fertilizer as a liquid. Uh, it's, it helps to tackle manifold problems, including wetland degradation, uh, re resulting in wetland conservation over time, and also it helps uh, to overcome the problem with uh, uh, unsustainable use of chemical uh, fertilizers and pesticides because we are coming up with a sustainable, uh, more eco-friendly solution to those uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. So uh, what we did was we collected invasive plants from the wetlands, like I said earlier, and then we processed the invasive plant uh, residues, and then we prototyped a number of versions of uh, the biopesticide, which we call Zolmol, and then we are now currently testing the prototypes and trying to come up with uh, better forms of the uh, biofertilizer. And uh, more to that, there is also several endeavors for community engagement. Uh, can you go over to the next slide? Yeah. So we are not just uh, trying to develop a tech solution, but we are also trying to think of a social uh, eco-entrepreneurship perspective like how social innovation can contribute to solving agri-food challenges, because we have a product that doesn't necessarily mean it will be widely used as it is, but we are trying to think of local supply chains and indigenous farming practices, and through appreciative and participatory inquiry tools, uh, which we are getting guidance from uh, John Hommel, our mentor from Wageningen University. He's uh, uh, helping us uh, develop a shared vision, vision for the community uh, around wetland restoration and sustainable and regenerative agriculture. So we are engaging the community, and in, our, in the lab, we are also trying to test the effectiveness of the product against um, fall armyworm for a pest, as an example. That's how we are moving forward. And we have a couple of uh, other grants that we are working on, including a grant from the UNDP and the Ministry of Environment of Italy, also, uh, uh, we got support from the World Food Forum uh, mentorship to get that grant. So we are moving forward with uh, integrative plans to um, figure out more innovative ways to incorporate biofertilizers and biopesticides in the local communities' uh, sustainable farming practices. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and I would like to thank my team members from Nepal who are mostly based in Nepal and doing most of the groundwork that I am a representative of today. And Special thanks to our mentors, uh, Yitze and John. And uh, please feel free to find our updates on our website. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Vivek. That's, that is very inspiring also to, to find a challenge and then have several solutions to go along with it. So um, we're, we're very proud to see the work that's coming out of your team and the rest of the Youth Food Lab. Um, and so on that note, we're going to move to um, the next uh, competition that we have. Uh, again, hopefully we'll get a number of new applicants coming out of today. And, and so this is going to be our World Food Forum Startup Innovation Awards powered by Extreme Tech Challenge. Um, and as we know, the scope of the challenges that we're talking about here in agri-food systems is massive. And to have any hope of addressing these, we really have to work with all stakeholders and we have to innovate with all stakeholders. And I think one key stakeholder is the private sector and in particular, 
the young startups, the young in innovators and entrepreneurs who are focused on finding the next creative solution that can drive catalytic and sustainable change. Um, so this is why in 2021 we created these awards with Extreme Tech Challenge. And we really hope that this will give more visibility and in addition to visibility, more opportunities for young entrepreneurs to be able to scale their ideas. So please <clears throat> join me in welcoming Nancy Yuan, the Strategic Program Manager at Extreme Tech Challenge, to tell us more about the fourth edition of the Startup Innovation Awards. Over to you, Nancy. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm delighted to kick off the fourth annual Startup Innovation Award powered by Extreme Tech Challenge alongside with our colleagues and friends. Extreme Tech Challenge cultivates the world's largest ecosystem of startup innovation committed to addressing the world's most urgent global issues as inspired by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Through a diverse range of competitions, thought leadership initiatives, and networking events, we've forged pathways for impactful partnerships that empower founders and drive sustainable change. By connecting startups with opportunities for mentorship, exposure and investment, Extreme Tech Challenge aims to drive technological advancement that have a meaningful impact on society and the environment. Reflecting on the success of the previous year's Startup Innovation Awards, we witnessed the incredible potential of startups in transforming the agri-food systems. From pioneering technologies to fostering inclusivity, the participating startups showcase unwavering de dedication to creating a more resilient and food secure future. We recognize the pivotal role played by entrepreneurs, NGOs, community organizations, and private sectors in driving structural change in agricultural landscape. It is through bold ideas, creative thinking, and collaborative efforts that we can surmount challenges and pave the way for a sustainable future. Through the Startup Innovation Awards, we aim to spotlight and support young innovators who are driving and transforming our agri-food systems. Last year, I had the privilege of hosting the final competition in Rome, where I was inspired by the founders' innovations and passion. I'm honored to return this year to celebrate and support the journeys and the impactful groundbreaking solutions of ad tech entrepreneurs. This year, we're introducing four startup competition categories and an overall startup innovation of the year award. The Digital Innovation in Food Processing Award celebrates startups at the forefront of digital or data solutions, enhancing efficiency, quality, sustainability, food safety, and labor conditions in the food processing industry. The Empowering Women in Agri-Food Systems Award recognizes startups empowering women in the global south, increasing their access to food, resources, finance, and technology for transformative impact. The Food Loss Award acknowledges startups addressing food loss through innovative technological solutions within the food supply chains. And finally, aligned with this year's World Food Forum theme, the Good Food for All for Today and Tomorrow Award honors startups developing sustainable solutions to food insecurity and promoting access to healthy diets worldwide. I extend our sincere thanks to Archer Daniels Midland, Kilburn and Strode, the Smart Sensors for Agri-Food, supported by High Five, Ching, and Next Tech Food Factories, and the United Nations Industrial Development Organizations for their invaluable support in championing innovation across these four categories. The final competition will be held live in October this year at the World Food Forum flagship in Rome. We look forward to seeing many young innovators across the world participating in this impactful initiative. The applications are open now. Visit Extreme Tech Challenge or the World Food Forum website for more information. Next, I'm pleased to introduce the winner of the 2023 Startup Innovation of the Year Award and the Better Production category, Zebra Crop Inc. Zebra Crop Inc. is Revolution Africa's post-harvest services platform for farmers to store, manage, and monetize their produce. 
Please welcome its founder and CEO, Buffy Okiki Ochidu. Thank you very much, Nancy, for the introduction and uh, pleased to be here. So as, as we may know, Africa's food systems face a series of challenges. At the core of this is a chronic gap for last mile post-harvest management infrastructure. The result is over 1.3 billion tons of food waste per year. In my country, Nigeria, that's over $9 billion lost per annum, um, alongside hindered farmer productivity. And this gap in infrastructure also leaves crops increasingly vulnerable to harsh climate conditions. The desperation resulting from these factors forces rural farmers to sell off what they can very quickly in a bid to salvage something and make some money inevitably keeping them trapped in a cycle of poverty. Now, these are some of the challenges that Zebra Crop Bank, our company, hopes to address. We have started by developing a tech-enabled network of micro solar-powered storage houses directly at farm gates, which we call crop banks. Um, at base level, these banks provide doorstep access to storage infrastructure, price transparency, markets, and credit. Um, allowing the farmers determine who to sell to, when to sell, at what price to sell, increasingly making them price makers and not price takers. At scale, uh, we will serve as a plug and play platform for other service providers to connect to rural farming communities. Um, over the past two years, we've deployed our solution across Nigeria and Cameroon. Um, Third-party services so far, we've attracted over $3 million worth of third-party services connecting to rural communities. Um, and we have deployed about 12 banks um, across these regions as well. In the, in the course of our work over the past, just over a year ago, um, through our partners, we heard of the Extreme Tech Challenge um, Innovation Award with FAO, and we applied for it keenly. I mean, we didn't think we would win, <laughs> but we applied for it. And um, when we got to the final, we were the semifinals. We were quite excited. And for us, that was a win. Uh, we never thought we'd make it to the semifinals, and we did. And that was a win as well. Uh, we got to Rome and um, won for the better production category and the innovation of the year. And since then, it's been like uh, someone applied jet fuel to our efforts. So it's a series of things have happened. On the one hand, it's created comfort for partners and potential partners. Um, on the other hand, it has inspired the curiosity, curiosity from the gatekeepers, you know? It's given them reason to pause and take a second look at the challenges we're trying to solve with an, the intention of supporting. Um, but finally, such programs and platforms and initiatives do two things. On the one hand, yes, it is validation, but more importantly, it emboldens companies and um, entrepreneurs who are typically trying to solve very daunting problems, emboldens them to move a bit more aggressively, a bit more confidently, um, ultimately in service of the communities they serve and to the benefit of the communities they serve. Thank you. Well, thank you, Buffy, and I'm glad to hear about the, the jet fuel, fuel that this has provided. I think hopefully we can all come together to get more jet fuel for all these solutions. And w once again, I, I think we see a, a, a number of challenges that you've solved with one solution, so nice work. Um, on that note, thank you as well <clears throat> to Nancy and Extreme Tech Challenge for partnering again. Uh, and I think now to talk a little bit more about maybe finding the next Zebra Crop Bank. Um, we have our partners at Unido, uh, Adnan Saric, who is the head of Innovation Lab at Unido, and we'll talk a little bit more about this new Food Loss Award and uh, Innovation Startup uh, Accelerator program that we're developing. So over to you, Adnan. Thank you, Ed, and <clears throat> thank you for inviting us and uh, um, giving us the opportunity today here to introduce the work of Unido, the Innovation Lab in particular, and the new program that we have launched and that we are in fact, um, piloting uh, together with um, 
FAO and World Food Forum uh, team in particular. So for those of you who may not be familiar with UNIDO, we are a specialized UN agency with the mandate to foster inclusive and sustainable industrial development around the world. <clears throat> we do so through projects and programs in more than 120 countries um, around the world um, with a very strong focus on issues that relate to um, climate, sustainable supply chains, and also, in fact, ending hunger. And this is also the basis, in fact, for the partnership that we are uh, presenting here today. Um, why do we do this? Well, we clearly see benefits from um, collaborating within the UN system and bringing <coughs> distinct or different UN agencies together with the respective expertise and mandates to tackle um, the grand challenges of our time. Um, and of course, there are a number of grand challenges uh, that we are that the UN as a system is trying to tackle uh, at the moment. Ending hunger, of course, being only one of them. Now, when you think about those grand challenges, um, there is a bit of a paradox in that we actually <clears throat> have all the knowledge and technology to solve them. Actually, it is abundantly available. The core of the issue is actually that this knowledge and technology is not being deployed where it is needed the most. So it tends to concentrate in oftentimes wealthy pockets around the world and doesn't spill over into the countries and regions that actually need them the most. So we have taken this as a motivation to think about more comprehensive programs uh, that tackle that issue at the core and have as one of the possible solutions, develop the UNIDO Solutions Accelerator, which is meant to, on the one hand, identify <coughs> young innovative solution providers like Buffy and his Zebra Crop Bank, but not stop at the stage where you bring Buffy to the stage and present what his company and his team can do, but also offer an extension to the services through a scale accelerator program where the idea is in fact to deploy these solutions in countries that at present are not benefiting of them and learn lessons on how to scale them, meaning how to bring them to larger uh, stratas of the population. And so for that we need partners and a partnership with FAO in the context of food supply chains or food uh, systems is a starting point, but we equally need partners like Nancy and Extreme Tech Challenge, um, private sector companies, especially those engaged in the uh, agribusiness sector, to pull along. And for that, UNIDO in this partnership is providing a platform to bring those partners together so that we can on the one hand identify innovative solutions, but on the other hand also offer a program that helps those innovators move to the next stage. And next stage oftentimes will actually mean for them how do we replicate these solutions in countries that at present are not benefiting from them. That is obviously a long-term process. But going abroad is plagued with a number of risks that oftentimes startups are not able to manage themselves. And this is where the program kicks in and de risks that deployment stage. So in very concrete terms, what we are doing as part of this pilot challenge or pilot initiative together with uh, our colleagues at FAO is identifying ways how to deploy innovative solutions that we have uncovered through the Joint Innovation Challenge to pilot countries that are in need of those solutions. And for that, we are opening up our own projects and programs on the one hand, but also our partners' programs in order to create test beds that provide safe environments for those enterprises to deploy the solutions and demonstrate how they work. Learn lessons in that process and subsequently scale. Now, scaling is a matter of Finance scaling is a matter of policy, so we see ourselves as a global platform that can actually mobilize all those relevant stakeholders and provide roundtables like this one today here to learn from what works and then scale what works. And for that, the UN is in a prime position as an honest and neutral broker to lead the dialogue and to bring the parties 
um, together. So in terms of um, the challenge that we'll be launching, we'll be focusing in particular on food loss and waste in supply chains. This is, of course, a topic that is at uh, the core of FAO mandates, but also UNIDOS, because we look at food supply chains or food systems from the production side of things. We look at it as integrated supply chains that are at the same level as any other uh, industrial supply chain, um, and hence can offer a range of services uh, in that process. So we'll, we'll be looking at our um, is an innovation challenge in the space of food loss and waste. We'll be looking in particular into identifying solutions that are um, enabling um, supply chains to function better from the farm gate all the way up to the consumer. And once we identify those innovative solutions, we'll be um, opening up the accelerator program um, in partnership with both public and private sector partners um, to help those innovators um, deploy and hopefully also um, scale. At the very end of this pilot initiative, of course, what we aimed or what we hope to do is to have more of a programmatic approach that we can um, also scale internally or scale between partners, meaning also bringing in bilateral, multilateral donors who are eager to support us along the way and increase our impact globally. So. Um, I'll stop here um, by, first of all, thanking FAO for um, the partnership or the good partnership so far, but also the other partners um, involved, and uh, very much looking forward to this uh, next, um, to the next steps, one of which will be, of course, a joint presence at the World Food Forum in October, where we'll be presenting um, the, the winners of the challenge but then also presenting, in fact, or opening up the accelerator program for the stage two, where we then also uh, present the pilot countries where we'll be running uh, the program. So very much looking forward to it, and uh, thank you once more. Thank you so much, Adnan, for that. Uh, we are so excited about this uh, brand new award and also for working very closely with you in future to develop uh, this joint accelerator program. So now we, is it working? Uh, now, um, we were going to have a little culture break because I know that everyone probably wants it. There's been a lot of information, a lot of uh, things for everyone to digest. So we were going to give everyone a, a couple minutes break for our cult head of culture to launch um, the World, uh, World Food Forum Film Festival. Unfortunately, we had te technical issues, so we can't launch that. It's very sad um, because, there, importantly, there is a category this year for best innovation film. So for all young filmmakers out there, uh, go ahead head to the website and have a look at that. But um, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Ed, who's going to launch the second part of the event. Over to you. Thank you, Celeste. And yeah, you can always see when we show the slide, there's a QR code. So please scan that. You can find all of these competitions that you can join, including the film festival mentioned by Celeste. Um, so in the next part, we've, or we've heard just now from a number of um, innovators and in technology. But in the science, technology, and innovation forum, we don't want to forget the scientists. Um, and so we have brought two, two young scientists with us today, Margaret Hegwood and Tarini Gupta, who are part of our World Food Forum Young Scientists Group. Um, they've joined us last year, actually, so in, in their second year here. And they will lead us in a short discussion on the role of young scientists in transforming agri-food systems amid multiple crises. Um, and they will also walk us through a little bit about the upcoming World Food Forum Young Scientists Group report um, as, and some of its key messages. So without further ado, over to Margaret and Tarini to walk through this. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, as uh, Ed said, my name is Margaret Hegwood. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Colorado Boulder in environmental studies. I'm also a United States uh, Department of Agriculture National Needs Fellow and a member of the FAO World Food Forum's Young Scientists Group. Um, Broadly, I think Trini and I just thought we'd give you a little bit of background about our work as scientists um, and what we're doing, particularly as young scientists. So for me, my work spans the food system um, and the food supply chain. Uh, I use data science to look at trade-offs and win-wins 
for everything from food loss and waste to the adoption of alternative proteins all around the world. Um, my previous work has taken me um, to do field work in parts of East Africa, also working in um, Europe, in the UK and Belgium, and now um, in the US predominantly. Um, I think really the amazing thing about being a scientist is, is getting to think about these challenges, kind of like what Carol was mentioning earlier, and thinking about them very holistically in a way that helps us make the best evidence informed um, decisions. Um, so I, I love that part of my work, but I'll let Tarini introduce herself now. Hi, I'm Tarini. I'm a nutritionist by training, but right now I'm pursuing my master's in public health at Yale University. Um, I will be graduating in a couple of days, but most of my research is really focused on how um, nutrition is affected by these external crises that we're facing. Uh, most recently, I worked on analyzing how climate change is impacting not just agri-food systems, but also food security and nutrition and, you know, all these different covariates, which I know is gaining a lot of momentum across different UN organizations for good. Um, another interesting part about my research is that I focus a lot on implementation or translational science, which is essentially um, a branch away from academia and research. So we have this research and we have this evidence that you know X works to get Y results, but how do you actually implement solutions in different regional contexts to make sure that um, you know they fit and the solutions are successful? So that's exactly why I'm very grateful to be a part of the Young Scientists cohort. I think it's um, amazing to be able to work with so many different thought leaders from so many different fields because you cannot be working in a siloed approach when it comes to agri-food systems, which was um, my approach prior to joining YSG, you know, having this more siloed nutrition approach, but now being able to work with people from agricultural or like climate change backgrounds is something very special. And now I'll pass it over to Margaret to speak a bit about different challenges that we face as young scientists and the types of support that we need from different international organizations and funders and researchers. Uh, great. Thank you, Trini. Um, so, yes, I want to talk about what it means to be a young scientist, particularly in agri-food systems. And like any scientist, I want to remind us what agri-food systems are. Um, we've sort of been talking about that a lot. And in the contents of science, technology, and innovation, there are obviously many fields. Um, so the FAO defines agri-food systems as comprising the entire range of actors and interlinked activities that add value in agriculture production and related off-farm activities, such as food storage, aggregation, post-harvest handling, transportation, processing, distri distribution, marketing, disposal, and consumption, which is a really, really big thing. <laughs> um, but I think today, you know, thinking about a scientist working, in, and as a scientist working in this field, um, you know, I think there are a lot of issues that young people face across the agri-food system, and, and I don't want to speak for the farmers or the producers in this scenario that face their own unique challenges. So really thinking about this from the perspective of young scientists. Um, the first thing I want to say in, in terms of challenge is what does meaningful engagement of young scientists actually mean? Um, I think we talk a lot about giving people a seat at the table. That seat at the table doesn't matter if you can't say anything or no one will listen to you. So I think that's the first thing that young scientists want is to not only be heard and invited, but be taken seriously, right? We dedicate our careers. This is my ninth year of schooling in a row, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> I, you know, and, and our entire careers to, to solving these challenges. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. The next thing I would say is we do live in a world with challenges like hunger and climate change, but the negative narrative and the doomerism is really um, disincentivizing and discouraging for young people. I think there are a lot of young people who are fighting and, and want to do amazing things, including scientists, and I think we need to recognize the toll that takes on the mental health of young people in particular and try to find hopeful narratives as well to encourage people in, um, in their engagement in science. 
The next thing I'll say um, from my personal experience as an individual with a background in engineering and now working more in data science fields is there's an extreme lack of technical skills um, amongst young people um, in their education in order to solve problems and make evidence-based decisions. We need to focus on this, I think, in education in general. Um, and, and that will really improve, I think, young people's opportunities, particularly in science and research. And then, of course, I'm sure we all know um, for every issue we have, funding is really important. And I think that includes for science, and that it particularly includes for scientists from disadvantaged backgrounds, funding them for their graduate degrees, for their research, for their grants, and being aware of the issues they face in terms of traveling um, to even present their science um, and the challenges that come with things like visas and um, being from particular countries that may um, make it a little bit harder to, to share and participate in science. Um, I'll pass it to Tarini now to talk more about our report and what we'll be talking about um, with our young scientist group. sentiments about the different challenges and yeah just to reiterate about you know what you said about the support we need um, it's also important to know that you know to be able to innovate and move towards this more solution oriented framework you need to take certain levels of risks but as young people with like fewer access to resources capital etc it's important to provide them some like financial or like mentorship opportunity so they have something to fall back on and have the ability to take different risks. Um, now I'll move on to speaking and introducing our report that is extremely, extremely exciting. So our report is um, Tech Technology for Multidimensional Engagement of Youth in Food Systems Transformation. What does that mean? That essentially means that you know we as youth and everyone, we're living in this rapidly evolving digital age, which can look like, you know, AI in the classrooms or chat GPT, which everyone is familiar with, I'm sure. But what we mean by you know this in terms of our report is two things one is how can youth or stakeholders leverage technology to include youth on decision tables where they could not th they could not be a part of this could look like something um for example like engaging youth in virtual modalities in conferences so that they have more ability to make decisions, especially youth from the global south. As we do know, visas are, are a big barrier and a big perpetuator of different global health inequities. The second um, focus is more on the traditional technological advancements when it comes to advancing our food systems, technologies to make farms, farming systems better, more efficient, more streamlined, more resilient to different climate threats that are really plaguing the young uh, food systems. Yeah, so those are the ma two main components of our report, and I'll leave it to Margaret to speak a bit more about it. Yeah, um, thanks, Trini. I think just wrapping it up, the last point I would make about this report is that we see there's sort of a, a gap, whether it's in farmers, right? Um, the average age of farmers around the globe often is greater than 50, in most cases greater than 50, uh, 60, um, in terms of engaging young people in, in agri-food systems. And then this is also true down the supply chain. Um, in the United States alone, something like 22,000 jobs every year go unfilled in, agri in agriculture. Um, I think the way to help fill this and also to just improve the food system in general is through engaging youth with technology and, and making them excited about agriculture. It's, it's not something that's you know, behind the times. It's in fact very, very tech forward. Um, and I think that our report will hopefully do a good job of um, highlighting ways to uh, uh, do that as well. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Margaret and Tarini, and thank you to all of the, the young scientist group. Um, I think hopefully you guys can provide us with that hopeful narrative that we can all take forward. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing your report and to seeing you in October at the World Food Forum flagship event. Um, I hope that our audience online has, has also been inspired by all these different stories. Um, we have uh, even more of these if, if you follow uh, what's going on at the World Food Forum and, and come and get involved. Um, but to close our session, I'm honored to have actually two guests that we're going to be introducing to give um, their reflections and closing remarks. And to begin, um, I'm very honored to introduce the ECOSOC ambassador from the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Katja Lesur. Uh, and the Netherlands has been a champion of youth in the World Food Forum for many years, um, actually having given the very first seed funding for the World Food Forum when we were just an idea of the youth committee. Um, so I think without the Netherlands, we, we might not actually be here today. 
um, and also for being strong um, supporters of innovation in particular. Um, I think the, the Youth Food Lab program that Bebek talked about um, has been strongly supported by the Netherlands, by Wageningen University, um, and, and it also has provided uh, funding or resources for the teams, not just to uh, attend and come together at the World Food Forum, but also some seed funding to get their ideas off the ground. So we're, we're very thankful for, for your support. Um, we are hoping that more um, partners, governments, um, all, all, all sectors can get involved in the same way. Uh, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to you for your uh, remarks. Over to you, Ambassador. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, very, very interesting presentations. Um, just off the top of my head, some reflections on what I heard today. Um, before I came to New York, um, the last five years, I was working in Ghana at the at our Dutch embassy. And actually, um, our entire work at the embassy consists of promoting innovation in food value chains, in particular cocoa and horticulture. And all the stories I heard around the table, very familiar, the problems that you face uh, when you're trying to innovate and trying to tackle uh, issues of food security. Um, so, yeah, my head is connecting all these ideas to what I used to do, but also to, to our work here, here at the UN. So I'm, I'm very pleased to have been invited to, to speak here and uh, um, would like to thank all the, the young people around the table for their interventions. So let me also thank the World Food Forum and FAO uh, for putting together this, to, this event. Um, it's an event, it's one in a series of wake-up calls, I would say. The UN Food System Summit concluded that we are not on track to achieve the SDGs and that we will not achieve them by continuing business as usual as Carol already um, explained. Uh, and climate change on top of that is wreaking havoc around the world and biodiversity loss is increasing. So it's, it's very dire. And the people that are undernourished or go hungry is increasing again after years of progression on this front. Um, so we need to indeed be serious about transforming our food systems. And this requires a mindset that is both creative and inclusive. Creative because innovations from both knowledge institutions and private sector could contribute to solving the challenges faced by the current food system. And technical innovations such as precision fermentation, but also systemic innovations like changing our intake of animal protein and taking a careful look at our land use should be taken into account. And inclusive because everybody in the system should be taken along in this transformation. And I'm, I paid particular attention to your intervention about inclusion of youth, because we can talk about meaningful youth inclusion, but if you're sitting at the table and nobody is taking you seriously, it's a waste of your time. And we here at the UN, as, as the Kingdom of the Netherlands, are very, very serious about meaningful youth participation on, on all fronts, but especially in this, in this area. So we believe that youth can and should play a vital role in these transformations. Today we saw the energy and creativity that is present throughout uh, the Youth Caucus. Whether it's students, farmer organizations, young people participating in FAO meetings, the need for change is felt everywhere. Youth can serve as an inspiration and can be an agent for change when it comes to transforming our food systems. We need to tackle food security, climate change, nutrition, and biodiversity issues, and we need to do it together. The inspiration that we saw in today's event is necessary to make our work more targeted and relevant. The challenge is also to break down silos. In the Netherlands, we use the Dutch diamond approach. We bring private sector, knowledge institutions. I heard Wageningen <laughs> many, many times. Um, yes, I think I've met everybody at that university already. Um, civil society, governments, and to tackle everything in a, in a holistic manner. In this way, innovations developed in universities and private companies don't compete but enhance each other and can be sure that they are targeted to situations that will actually help farmers, people, and societies. Ladies and gentlemen, we require, require a firm look at what our food system should look like in the future. Collective creativity and action will be vital if we want to achieve our goals. 
the inspiration of young people will guide us to make our work ever more relevant to this necessary transi transition. So you can count on the Kingdom of the Netherlands as a partner in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and uh, it's so wonderful to hear about the Kingdom of the Netherlands' commitment to, to meaningful youth engagement, and we, uh, we really appreciate your con continued support for everything that we do here at the World Food Forum. So to deliver the closing remarks for today's session, or the second closing remarks, <laughs> I am pleased to invite the director of the FAO's Office for Innovation, Vincent Martin. Vincent and his team are leading the innovation work for all of FAO in support of transforming agri-food systems, and they have also been champions of supporting the work of our youth in this context. Vincent and his office are organizing the Science and Innovation Forum components of this year's World Food Forum flagship event in October. Vincent, thank you for your continued support, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you uh, today. Thank you for the uh, invitation. I was here to attend uh, another meeting of the uh, UN, um, UN Innovation Network, which is gathering today. And we had great discussion on how we, could, we should join forces across the UN system to really foster innovation and support the youth uh, in their uh, uh, innovation uh, journey. Uh, I would like to give a special thanks to uh, Carol Bellamy, the chair of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund and former executive director of UNICEF for inspiring opening remarks. And I very much like when she mentioned uh, anticipation. I think that's uh, a very important word, anticipation. We need to be more anticipatory in terms of policy, in terms of planning, and this is what brings uh, innovation. I also like when she mentioned that uh, we need to clear the path for the youth and, uh, and then get out of their way in some ways. <laughs> I think it was, it was really, uh, really uh, interesting, uh, an interesting concept. Uh, I would say what is interesting, and it also links back to the conversation we had on uh, we need to listen to the youth, it's also, uh, it's not about the youth talking to the youth, it's about creating this intergenerational conversation. It's uh, about connecting each other and not repeating the same thing we've been doing for years and years. I had a short conversation just before the meeting here with a young scientist and I realized that working on topics I was working myself 20 or 30 years ago. And, uh, and I think this is by this exchange, we can really help them accelerate what they are doing and not just repeating the same mistakes we did. So I think this, uh, this conversation between the youth and the one who are a little bit less young, <laughs> is, I think it's, it's, extremely, uh, it's extremely, uh, extremely important. I would like very much to thank uh, Ambassador Lasser for your very valuable insights. Uh, I think we are thinking uh, along the same lines and, and very much uh, uh, appreciate the support of the, of the Netherlands to FAO in the field of innovation. You are really the champions of innovation uh, in the UN system, I could say. You are not the only one, but you are really the champions, and in FAO particularly. Uh, in addition to supporting the uh, uh, World Food Forum and the, uh, the Youth Food Lab, you are also uh, going to support the creation of an acceleration zone within FAO, which is, I think, uh, fantastic. So it's a new initiative we are, we are piloting. Um, now, I must say I've been very, very much in inspired by um, what, I heard, uh, what I heard today. And for your information, uh, FAO has put uh, uh, innovation at the core of its strategic framework. So within our strategic framework, uh, we now have uh, two accelerators, uh, which are the core of the, uh, of the strategy, which is innovation and technology. So we have really put this uh, uh, innovation as a compass for uh, the program of, uh, of FAO. And we launched the first ever uh, science and innovation strategy of FAO in 2022. Um, uh, it sounds a little bit late to have a science and innovation strategy just in 2022 for FAO, but it's, it, I mean, it's, it's better than uh, uh, late than <laughs> that never. And uh, so now we have a framework. We do have a, a strategic framework, this science and innovation strategy, to, or, to really mainstream innovation across the organization. So that, I think that's, uh, that's a great innovation. And the different examples I was hearing today really reflected what we've put in the science and innovation strategy. And the first point 
uh, what really resonated in me is uh, the report you did on, uh, on the, the young scientists and the work you are doing and the challenges you are facing. And when you mentioned the importance of uh, evidence-based uh, decision-making, it is the first pillar of our uh, science and innovation strategy. How do we bring evidence? How do we use data to help policymakers to take the right decisions? So, and how do you translate? How do you translate uh, uh, science into something meaningful that can really be used and grasped by policymakers, but also by, uh, uh, by farmers? So I think it was really, really interesting to hear from you, to hear your challenges, and, and it's our responsibility to really uh, address these different challenges. And then I very much liked uh, uh, your, your, the different presentations we had, which relates to the second pillar of the science and innovation strategy, which is how do we close the science, technology, and innovation gap? There is a gap, there is a divide. That is to say, solutions are there. They are being produced in uh, incredible quantity, I would say, but they don't reach the one that most need it. And we need, it's a, our responsibility to close this gap to bring the solutions to the people who most, uh, who most need it. And I really loved uh, uh, the way you are uh, bringing science to the field, the way you are translating global concepts, such as One Health, into action. I've been working on One Health concept for years, uh, since its inception, basically. Which it started in 2004 with the HPAI crisis. And, uh, and sometimes I just feel we are just going into circle, we're just repeating the same thing, but here, with this approach, you are really bringing this concept, which has been discussed for 20 years, you bring it to the field, and you, you, you create a team, a multidisciplinary team of experts, bringing social sciences into your team, which I think it's, uh, it's really fantastic. I love the uh, community-driven innovation uh, that was uh, mentioned by Bibek through his uh, wet, Wetlands for uh, uh, Nepal project. Uh, working with the communities in the field, developing, co-creating solutions um, uh, for the benefit of the community. I think it was really uh, inspiring. And doing the same with startups. Uh, so it could be non-profit, but also profit. And uh, having a startup that really look at uh, how, do we, um, how do we combat food waste and, and loss. And all this work that is catalyzed by the World Food Forum, by this fantastic team, is to really to catalyze innovation, to mainstream innovation, to give you a chance, if you have an idea, to bring this idea to maturity. So I think that's uh, something that FAO didn't have it a few years back, but now, with the World Food Forum, with the Office of Innovation, we are trying to uh, help you realize your, your uh, ideas. And then we mentioned also the uh, changing of mindset. I think that's something which is really, really important, uh, and uh, taking risks. So we, uh, this is what we are trying to do also through the uh, Office of Innovation and uh, FAO Innovation Strategy is to uh, create a safe space for innovation uh, with uh, funding, with also mentoring, and showing that uh, taking risk can be rewarded. So that's also a, a very important dimension that came up in some of the discussion. And finally, the follow-up. It's not just about catalyzing innovation or helping you to find solutions, but then what's next? And the worst that can happen is that you get into what we call in business terms, the valley of death. You've created a, an enterprise, you did, did your startups, you created something super exciting, but then you've got difficulties to find resources. And this is where the partnership comes in. And this partnership with Unido is particularly, I think it's really, uh, really interesting, because then whatever has been uh, created in the labs can be then taken over by other partners who have the strength also to bring you to another step. So I very much look forward for this partnership with UNIDO. And uh, we are partnering also with other UN agencies, of course, and uh, including with uh, an initiative called UN Global Pulse, which looks specifically at how do we scale up innovations. So we are connecting uh, the work we are doing in FAO, we are connecting with the UN Global Pulse, UNIDO, and other UN organization, so that uh, uh, these uh, new solutions don't end up in, uh, in some sort of a vacuum uh, afterwards. Um, so now to, to conclude, I just would like to say something which is a little bit cliche, but it is uh, to urge the uh, wide range of stakeholders who are joining us in person and online at this year's um, STI Forum to continue, continue to support youth and youth-led solutions and to foster an environment that empowers young people to lead, to innovate, and to become drivers of positive change. 
And for the young people who are watching us uh, today, you have seen there are several ways where your ideas can receive concrete support and resources. And uh, I would like to encourage all the young agri-food system researchers with an innovative ideas to apply to this year's World Food Forum Transformative Research Challenge, where there will be more than 200,000 uh, US dollars in research grants and prizes available. And for the young entrepreneurs and youth-led startups that are transforming agri-food system, I encourage them to apply to the World Food Forum Startup Innovation Awards, powered by the Extreme Tech Challenge, and with partners like FAO and Unido. These competitions, they give you young leaders and entrepreneurs the platform, exposure, and support to scale up and develop their initiative so that they can fulfill their full potential. And finally, I would like to express my gratitude to all participants, speakers, and organizers for their valuable contribution. And I would like to invite you to join in October in Rome, the fourth World Food Forum, uh, including another uh, session of the Science and Innovation Forum that we'll organize, and I think it will be a very uh, exciting event uh, uh, this year. We are trying to make it very interactive and very innovative. So um, I would like to welcome you to the Science and Innovation Forum. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you to all of the speakers who have joined us today. I think um, in honor of the theme of this event, I will move out of the way for my younger colleague, uh, Celeste, to give the final words while we look at the QR code, but over to you, Celeste. Yeah, thank you so, so much to all of our participants and to everyone who supported in uh, the creation of this event, getting it. It was so wonderful to have you all here in person. Thank you. for Some people have come quite far in their travels, so thanks so much for that. Uh, so if you haven't done so already, please do scan the QR code. You can. It will take you to the World Food Forum website where you can find out more about all all of our programs, the TRC, uh, the Youth Food Lab, and the Startup Innovation Awards, which have been launched today. And of course, we really hope we'll see all of you in October at the World Food Forum in Rome. Thank you.